hi, this is John Linnebal, and this is AP US History Video 4, The Social Structure of Spanish America, Divergent Worldviews of Europeans and Native Americans. The Casta System. Spanish America had a caste system similar to India that was based on ethnicity. As you might guess, Casta meant caste. Traditional Notions of Pure Blood. White European superiority, or white supremacy if you like, certainly existed as an idea among the Spanish explorers and conquistadores. It certainly made conquest less mentally distressing. The idea if you're conquering a race that you believe to be inferior to your own, you're not going to feel too bad about whatever brutality you had to perform. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Spanish men in the New World greatly outnumbered Spanish women. Furthermore, natives massively outnumbered Spaniards. As a result, intermarriage was very common. Spaniards born in Spain to Spanish parents were peninsulares, those who were born in America but were of Spanish descent, but born in America is what I'm trying to say, were Creoles. The children of Spanish men and native women were mestizos, which means mixed, and they were the next lower caste after the pure Spanish. Lower than the mestizos were the mulattoes, those born to Spanish men and African women. The lowest caste, of course, were just pure Native Americans and Africans, or I suppose Native Americans who intermarried with Africans. There were many gradations based on the specific percentage of Spanish versus Native or African ancestry. You can think quadroons, octoroons, Louisiana race law, laws. An octoroon is an eight-sided cookie. That's a George Carlin joke. Ha ha ha. But no, they had all these very specific gradations based on the percentage of European blood. So an octoroon was somebody had was believed to have seven parts European blood to one part African blood, for example. Anyway, here's a website where you can look this up. I'll also put it in the description below when I'm done recording this and you can find out from Louisiana State University all the terminology that was used and is used in discussing for example Louisiana race laws so it makes sense that it's at LSU let's move on different worldviews of Europeans and natives Europeans and Native Americans had different ideas about the world which led to conflict and misunderstanding. As the Spanish worked for conquest and domination of the New World, both Spaniards and Natives adopted useful aspects of each other's culture. Spain managed to use its navy, the Spanish Armada, to keep other European nations mostly out of the Americas until 1588 when it was defeated by the English Navy at the Battle of Trafalgar. Cultural Misunderstandings for example, European society is and was patrilineal. The name, etc., passes through the father. So my father's last name was Linnebal. So that's why my last name is Linnebal. Okay. Indian slash native societies were often matrilineal. So the name passes through the mother. Things pass through the mother. Europeans uh, believed in the individual ownership of land. Natives did not have that idea of individual land ownership. It just kind of belonged to a group of people, probably their tribe, for example. Adaptation in New Spain. Some natives became Christians, modifying it to meet their needs, ideas, etc. Some just became regular Catholics. Others developed their own religious beliefs, for example, Santeria in Cuba. And here's a website where you can look up things about Santeria to see about that kind of religion that was adapted from Catholicism and African religions. Resistance by Native Americans and Africans. Natives and Africans didn't adopt European ideas about land ownership, culture, gender roles, family structure, religion, nature, etc. wholesale. They didn't just say, oh, okay, well, the Spanish took over. We're going to do what the Spanish do. They developed strategies to resist assimilation into European culture despite their subjugation and defeat. I mean, they were defeated militarily. They had to live in the society, but it didn't mean they had to entirely cave into Spanish domination. Native American resistance in New Spain. Some natives fled Spanish conquest, leading to overpopulation in other regions and consequent conflicts. Also violent resistance. The Guale people lived near Spanish mission in St. Augustine, which was one of the four missions in the Spanish Florida. The Guale Indians, and I apologize if I butchered that pronunciation. Anyway, the Guale or Huale, however you pronounce that, Indians revolted against missionaries, trying to assimilate them, killing several missionaries. This was called Juanilo's Revolt. Acoma Pueblo people versus Juan de Oñate. 
Spanish had a violent confrontation with the Pueblo in what we now call New Mexico. Juan de Oñate was a Spanish conquistador and his soldiers occupied land that were owned by, was the traditional homeland of the Acoma Pueblo tribe in the 1590s. So in the 1598, okay, in 1598, Acoma refused to obey orders from Spanish troops to give them supplies they needed to survive the winter. The Pueblo killed 15 troops, including Oñate's nephew. Oñate responded by firing cannons from a mesa over the Acoma village, killing more than 800 natives. Survivors were tried by the Spanish for their crimes against their occupiers, I guess. And many men, instead of many man, okay, should have proofread this better. Anyway, over 25, possibly as many as 80 men had one foot amputated as a punishment. The remaining 500 were enslaved by the Spanish. So here we have a little plaque from Texas about the Juan de Onate expedition, 1598. Spanish in the interest in the territory known as New Mexico increased during the 1580s and 1590s. And so we can see the party of 400 men left Santa Barbara in uh, 1598. They crossed the Chihuahua Desert to the El Paso area. All right. So, okay, so I moved on into New Mexico to bring on Spanish rule. Anyway, let's move on. Differing perceptions of Native Americans, the development of the belief in white superiority. As you probably already guessed, and we've already discussed a little bit, racism was used to justify horrible acts by conquistadores, colonizers from other countries as well, not just the Spanish. Domination, theft, etc. Pretty hard to accept and it's hard to square or harmonize with your image of yourself as a good person unless you believe that the people you've done it to are themselves bad and deserve it. Uh, so thus the pure blood issue. Very few people were pure Spanish, European, etc. in the New World, so it was easy to have a pyramid-shaped social hierarchy based upon the proportion of European blood and use the lack of European blood as an excuse to oppress the minority. I'm sorry, not the minority, the majority. So, you know, most of these people did not have much European blood, if any. Bartolome de las Casas was a Spanish priest who criticized Spanish colonialism as barbaric and describing it as one of the most unpardonable offenses committed against God and mankind. Gee, tell us how you really feel, Bartolome, but no. Anyway, pretty cool guy. He wrote a book called A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, written in 1542, and was published in 1552, and Alex Casas' book chronicled the atrocities against the Native Americans, etc. And this appears to be an Italian translation of that book here, and here is a painting of that priest Bartolome de las Casas. Juan Ginés de Sepulveda, again, if I butchered that pronunciation, I'm sorry. He was a theologian who took the opposite viewpoint as de las Casas. He believed that natives were inferior, so wars of conquest against them were just wars. It's a very popular idea in the Catholic Church over the years as well. Are, are wars just wars? Are they morally justifiable or acceptable? And so that's what we mean here, morally acceptable wars, not wars that are trivial. In other words, he wasn't saying, hey, they're just wars, no big deal, right? No, that's not what they mean. They mean just in the sense of morally right. So the idea is that there was a natural law that would sort the races into their best positions as natural slaves or natural masters. Guess which races were which? Well, the ones that happened to have cavalry and heavy weapons and carried a lot of germs that killed the other ones, they turned out to be the master race. And the natural servants were the races that got sick and died and just weren't able to fight effectively against them. So that's why the Spanish European colonizers were the master race and the inferior race was everybody else. Okay. See any parallels to anything going on today? I don't know. Maybe something that happened in the 1940s at least? Okay. Anyway. Debate over Spanish colonization. British counts presented Spanish colonization as particularly brutal. There was the black legend, which a Spanish historian invented that term to describe in about 1914. So the Spanish historian invented that term to describe other European powers' description of Spanish colonization as more brutal than their colonization. So the British might say, oh my God, you can't believe how brutal these Spanish people were. Um, of course, 
that's a bias. Nobody likes to think, hey, my country's the bad guy here. My country did really bad things. If they do, it's like, well, hey, look, compared to us, these guys are real, real jerks, you know, but, but you wouldn't even believe what this country did. They were lucky that our country came and colonized them and not those guys. So you want to keep this in mind when reading source documents on the AP exams. There may be a bias towards showing that the author's country's colonization was altruistic, you know, motivated by doing nice things for people. That might be something like, our missionaries worked selflessly to introduce God to the poor heathens, you know, so the poor Native Americans could actually go to heaven and meet God because they would become Christians, you know, da da da. Um, and others countries colonization as simple greed and criminality. Oh, the Spanish, the Spanish pillaged the New World, forcing the natives to farm and mine for them under pain of death. You know, the idea is, you know, yeah, God, golden glory. Yeah, just try the golden glory. There's no God in that. Anyway, the exam will tell you who wrote the documents, at least what country they came from, etc., when it was written. So you can literally consider the source, as people say. Or as another slang term people use, look who's talking. So you should look who's talking or look who's writing when you look at these kind of historical documents on the AP exam. Did you find this video useful? If you did, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? It's simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours. That's 240,000 minutes of view time in a year. While many of these people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time. I also don't have 1,000 subscribers at this time, although I'm getting very close. So, for the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I'd appreciate your input. I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism, you know, trolls, or things that are off topic, you know, spammers, disturbed people, whatever. You can also hire me for tutoring. You can go to my website, www.johnlinnevault.com, and look me up and contact me if you want to do tutoring either in person or through Zoom. Of course, we want to obey all state, local, federal laws and regulations and common sense given the COVID crisis that's still going as I'm recording this. Anyway, thanks for watching, and my contact information is on the next slide. Contact me, Facebook, Instagram, email, phone, Facebook. You can go to facebook.com, just hit the forward slash Linneball Tutoring, or look up John Linneball Tutoring using their search function and you'll find me. Instagram, you can go to www.instagram.com forward slash John dot dot tutoring. Phone number, you can call me at 415-623-4251. That's my cell phone, you can even text me if you want. Email. It's john at johnlinnebald.com. Website, www.johnlinnebald.com and www.johnlinnebaldtutoring.com. Both of those URLs just go to exactly the same website, so just pick the one you like better. Testpreparation.locals.com. That's my website. That's on locals.com. And why not check it out? Why not become a subscriber? You know, you can definitely help me out financially, and you'll get to see a lot of content there. Mailing. If you want to send me something by good old postal mail, help out the USPS by sending some mail, you can reach me at John Linneball Tutoring at 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And one final message. This is not a substitute for your classes, your text, etc. I hope you watch all these videos, hope you love these videos, but this video is based on Barron's AP United States History Review Book, 4th edition, and to a lesser extent, Princeton Review's AP U.S. History 2019, and my general knowledge of U.S. History. I strongly suggest you get an AP Review Book if you don't have one, or at least look at one from the library. While these should all help you do well on the AP U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about in his or her own tests or on his or her own tests, whatever you want to say, homework, etc. So please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class because you want to get a good grade on the tests and everything else, on your report cards, not just the AP exam, where of course I hope you get a five. All right. That's it for me. I'm out of here. Hope you have a good day. Thanks.